Good morning. Um, I love the sepia tint. It sort of <laughs> suits the 1912 to 1923 time period. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, we'll introduce ourselves as we do our section. We're, we're Tweedledee and Tweedledumming it this morning. Um, and we will interrupt each other, so please bear with us. And, of course, it's a great privilege and always very disconcerting to have to follow Mike. So we will do our best. What we're going to do today is actually give you the counterpoint. We're here to give you a case study on our first MOOC. Yes, there will be more than one. So we did well, and we've got the funding for the second one. So really what we're going to do is less on the, the mass pedagogy, more about lifting the lid and looking under the hood about what we did for the Irish Lives in War and Revolution MOOC that we've run. But before I start, just, just a couple of general comments. Um, the Arizona State University infomercial, extending the gifts of civilization. Did anyone else notice that? With the earlier comments about neocolonialism. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, to leave that as a, as a first thought um, and move on. Is the sound going on this? It is. Yes. What better way to start than a video? What made you the living to extraordinary giants? Between 1912 and 1923, Ireland experienced radical changes that were already still. It was marked by revolution, guerrilla warfare, civil war, and partition. The history of this period has been told, retold, and constantly contested. But this course will attempt to do more than just focus on the familiar dates and places. When we encounter a different kind of war and revolution with multiple voices and multiple truths. Over six weeks, leading historians in the field will challenge your understanding and certainty of what people thought they were fighting. Why did people fight? What was won and lost, and by whom? What were the consequences for the ordinary man and woman? It was often when this scene, all the historians broke the camera. My impression was almost built in for whatever they said that it was. My story is coming in one act. And in the sense, I think what this move should be about is maybe being honest enough to say sometimes we often don't have an answer to the world. No. It's actually exciting that it's a different pursuit of materialism. Everybody's experience is history, whether it's whether it's a fine list. The reason I started that, not to show you the glossy high production values, but that is actually a very important point in and of itself. And it's very interesting, Mike's saying about the BBC, because we decided to go high quality, no excuses. Because there's a reputational risk with MOOCs that we addressed initially, immediately in our designing. And we put in a huge effort into the design and a huge effort into the production values with the concomitant resources and cost implications of that. But more importantly for me, because I'm an educational technologist before I became the associate dean, is that line that one of the historians, Anne, sorry, we call them collectively the historians in the online education unit. And Anne, from the very first moment they sat with us, they said, we don't want to do a standard timeline. We don't want to do the school history. We don't want to do what happened through the chronology of the years. We don't even want to be on camera. Now, that was quite disturbing as you're a designer trying to say we've got these great academics. But they wanted to do it the other way around, through the authentic lives of the people through this period. So from the very first outset, we were trying to embody this pedagogic, disciplinarial approach through the MOOC. And I find this very interesting. I was in Copenhagen on Monday, and somebody was saying, ah, MOOCs, they're a backward step pedagogically. And it's interesting, Mike was saying, because in the early MOOCs they were. But what we were trying to do was not only all the social learning and engagement, but we're trying to embody this vision that our academics had about an alternative way of teaching history. And um, we're pleased to say it went very well. But primarily the rationale. Um, Trinity has moved into the online education space. It's created me, the first associate dean of online education. And we generated a two-year pilot involving some online postgraduate masters and some MOOC. And I'm pleased to say that we now have a five-year strategy where we're aiming for a thousand online postgraduate students and we'll continue with the developed MOOCs because we see them as intertwined. On a side note, as a college officer in Trinity, I have to sign an oath in Latin to the provost every year. 
and the two scholars disagreed over online education and how it translates into Latin. So according to Google Translate, I am the curator of internet studies. <laughs> so they managed to translate internet, which still confuses me. But basically the rationale that we said for engaging with MOOCs was the recognition that we are in a globalized higher education space. And basically as the higher education institution, if we're not operating in that space, we're moving behind just by dint of not being in there. But also there was a strategic alignment in that we were putting ourselves out there and we're saying we're a global university and a global institution and we were taking that risk of putting our education online as well as looking inside college to provide good exemplars of technology and learning and the bit that most people forget to us it was a public good it's part of our mission as an institution to actually extend our learning outside of the walls into the general public now I won't spend too much time on this but um, Basically, we followed the Future Learn pedagogy. We were one of the first international partners, and I've been working with Mike on the Future Learn team from within the first six months, I think, and going over and meeting their design team who were building the infrastructure from scratch um, in a basement, I believe it was, in Camden, was quite a sight, and, and fair play to them, they, 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 they did it. But we ended up creating six weekly sessions with 121 individual steps. And as Mike said, the learners can comment on each, and each module was delivered over one week and statements of participation were available. But in line with our historian's disciplinary approach, they didn't work on a strict chronology. It was very much the generation of characters and personalities, some real, some imagined from that time. And looking at more thematically, fighting lives, political, social, economics. And of course the irony of an Englishman leading the team that created this about the Irish revolution against the English wasn't lost on, on my team, who are primarily Irish. But interestingly, what we did was it ended up being quite a close and interesting collaborative experience between obviously FutureLearn with huge input. They're not just a platform provider to us, they were people we bounced ideas off. The Department of Online Learning, myself, the project manager of the team, and the Department of History. And really, in effect, this space here was vital. During the early days, we were struggling to understand the historian's vision of the MOOC. We were thinking, in a way, quite embarrassingly to admit, and I'm quite conscious I'm being recorded while I say this, we were thinking in a very much traditionally didactic mode, despite the fact that we do very interesting things in a course in our research center. And it was the historians that actually knocked us out of that and said, no, we don't want to do it that way. We want to invent lives. We want to let people realize that when you're living in that period, you don't know what's happening the next day to get that real sense of engagement. And we want to engage the community, it's interesting again Mike's comments about citizen inquiry, to share their stories of their parents and their grandparents because it's in the recent enough past to contribute in a meaningful way. And so it was an interesting experience. I don't think the historians of mind be saying that um, they're now thinking of buying smartphones. And not only that, they're now moving into other technology-enhanced research learning projects. So in lots of ways, these were some of the hardest people in college you would expect from literature to work with. They were not technology-enabled in their teaching and learning activities. But what they did have was commitment and energy. So again, the traditional MOOC structure that follows through that, that Mike went through, so you've stolen a bit of our thunder there. We were supposed to show and tell on this section. Um, and again, it's very interesting what's been said about the visibility. And in fact, we've started looking at how we're providing our online courses and tweaking some of that in the light of our experience from FutureLearn. Again, what was important for us was the fact that the discipline affects the design and the discipline affects the pedagogy. Because of the nature of the course and the, the history, we were able to send all of the learners out to these authoritative resources of authentic materials. So, of course, we provide resources, but in the MOOC we are able to provide the techniques and habits of becoming a historian. So all of a sudden, very soon, we shifted away from we will teach you the key events of 1912 to 1923 to we will try and give you some sense of what it was like to be a real person in that time, and we will try and imbue and recognize your abilities as a historian from your own personal stories, and from the archive material that was there. And this was another strong theme that we ran in. Some of the key elements that we found very powerful. 
you have the comments and the discussions next to every activity and asset. And that was very powerful. I think we were getting up to about 1,000 comments going on that. But the discussion points were, were different. They were specific activities that you would put up. So, for example, in the last videos, what is your definition of a fighter? What did it mean to be a fighter? And it was an activity. So it was quite focused. It's like constructing a really good discussion board question in an online or blended course. And a huge amount of time and effort went into the construction of these questions. And what was interesting was we were able to get the feedback very fast from the quantitative and qualitative measures of the learner engagement as to had we pitched the question right. I mean, one, to me, one of the favorite questions was, what was one word that described this period? And all of a sudden, the learners had to go, what, one word? I want to write 200. And I think one of the ones we used what came out was complex. But it was very interesting and challenging questions. A huge amount of design went into just the simple questions that we used on the discussion points. The quizzes and peer assessments, again, were very positive. Um, and Sylvia will talk a little bit about some of the data that we've generated from it. And the online discussions and social learning were extremely dynamic across the entire MOOC. We're moving on to develop other MOOCs, and one of the things that I'm quite concerned about is history is a very discursive subject. Plus, we're talking about something in relatively recent terms, something that's still culturally relevant, something that we talk about grandparents. In fact, in the Irish context, I've been here long enough to understand you still have the civil war divisions in politics. So it's very timely. But what about the challenge of getting discussions going in a topic that is perhaps less discursive? And we're looking forward to addressing that in the upcoming MOOCs. So in lots of ways, people think, oh, MOOC about something so qualitative and subjective as history must be difficult. On a social learning platform, it was actually quite straightforward. We were able to leverage the nature of the discipline and the content in developing social learning itself. So I'll hand over to Sylvia now. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, my name is Sylvia Gallagher. Um, I was the online community manager and implementation officer for Irish Lives. So basically, my role was to act as an intermediary between the Department of Online Education and the Department of History. So really supporting the Department of History in their interactions with their learners and their transitioning to teaching in an online environment. So uh, we have had two runs of Irish Lives. Uh, so the first one was last year, which we had 18,000 learners. And then we've just finished our second one on <coughs> Sunday, which we had 11,000 learners. Um, so these were six-week courses. And again, my role really was to evaluate and bring awareness to really social learning and um, the importance of moderation and examining the community, and really being um, a bridge between the Department of Online Education and the Department of History. And I was a non-domain expert, so my expertise is in online communities. Um, it's not to do with history. I didn't do history for the leading search, so I really have no, no real idea of it. So it was really a challenge for me to be a, a moderator within this space that I didn't really know much about. So how did I do that? Really, um, it's kind of what I was saying was how, to, how can I can manage complexity. So I use quantitative and quantitative reflection. I use a very structured approach, and I always liaised with uh, the Department of History and everything that I did. So who are the learners? These are just some quick statistics about them. So um, our learners, actually we had 26% uh, of them were over uh, 55. We had the majority of them were actually from outside of Ireland. And we had more males than females. I think very um, interestingly, 71% uh, had no previous online course experience. Um, and I thought it was very interesting that this was their first experience of um, an online course. It's one that was with Trinity College in Future Learn and perhaps in a location that was not, um, it was outside of their home country as well. So how do we engage with the learners? We did it in two ways. We did it both internally and externally. So internally was within the MOOC, within the discussions. So the Department of uh, History would um, reflect uh, upon the learner comments, and I would help them reflect on these comments as well, give them tips, tell them which would be the comments that I think that they would benefit most to reply to. Um, I would also have some input with technical queries and giving guidance to, um, to students as well. Then externally as well, we had twice weekly emails, so on both Mondays and Fridays we would send emails to all the learners. The Monday emails would describe what would be going on, um, on the week ahead, and the Friday email would reflect on the content that had been talked about um, in the previous week. Also, future learners were excellent, they always were very helpful with any queries that myself or Tim or the Department of History had. 
and, and especially with, with, with things like resolving learner issues or any conflict between learners as well. So this is just um, a graph, one of the many um, great data sets that were given by Future Learn, which describes the comment activity. So we had 67,000 comments in the Irish Lives um, um, MOOC, and with over 4,800 unique authors. So if you look at this graph here, so we have the steps on the horizontal axis, and we have the number of comments on the vertical axis. So we can see that at the start, there's um, two major peaks. And these were when we asked students to, uh, learners to introduce themselves. So tell them a little, a little bit about themselves, their background, why they're interested in history. And I think it's very important to um, start social interaction between learners and um, encourage social expression and socialization, which is very important for learner retention and really creating a community of learners. Then we can also see across this more um, peaks. These were mainly the discussion points which always um, elicited lots of conversation between learners. So um, again, how did I monitor and moderate this community? Um, I used uh, domain-specific keywords, so I talked with the Department of History, what are the things that you think I should look out for? Uh, the most liked posts, um, queries and negative comments, who were the power users, who were the leaders, who were the users that were really driving conversation? Uh, were there any flag posts? Again, looking at the discussion points, and examining any Trinity-specific comments as well. So what were these learner comments? So um, I did a little thematic analysis just to see what were the, the, the main areas that people were looking at. So number one was discussion of course resources. So they would talk about the videos, the articles, the external resources provided. Uh, personal narratives were huge. So um, our learners loved talking about themselves and their personal histories. For example, I'm a second generation Irish American. My grandfather was a member of the Flying Column of South Mayo under Tom McGuire. And there was also a great sense of virtual community, so they really relished in the fact that they were talking with other learners. And there was peer support, thanking one another, and uh, sharing resources. These were external resources, not, not necessarily the ones that we had given to them. And also, of course, feedback for ourselves. Thank you. It's almost as good as walking through the Arch of Trinity and studying on the grass. So, um, for so cheaper. <laughs> um, so this is just another um, uh, data set that we were given by Future as well, which shows the course activity, which you can see that over time it does decrease, and it's very useful for us to see what steps worked and what didn't. You can see that um, there was two there which were visited and not completed. These were actually the peer reviews and peer assessments, which were quite successful. And many, many learners found them very good. From the comments, you can see that they really did like them. But again, they weren't something that all learners did, did take part in. Um, so what were the course outputs and results? So our course was 95% rated um, uh, positive and 98% uh, recommended. This was from the post-course post survey of the first one of Irish Vice. Um, we've had, we had 18,000 joiners. Of them, we had 11,000 learners. 10,000 were active learners. I, they had completed at least one step of the course. 53% um, were returned, so they come back, and we have 25% participating. If you can see the numbers just below here with the little green arrows, they're the future learn average. So you can see how much we were above the future learn average for all of these KPIs. And I think most notably you can see that our social um, our social KPI was very high. So 41% of our learners were talking to each other. And I think that's a really great um, it's a great um, description of how our MOOC worked very well with learners, that they really did interact with one another. Um, so just talk a little bit about the research outputs that we had and um, that we're working on at the moment. Um, so when we were talking with the Department of History and Department of Online Education, we realized that a lot of the learners were talking about personal narratives and talking about themselves and their personal histories. And we found that it was very interesting that MOOCs were almost like a generative, um, a generative repository or a generative source for historical research. So things like public history research and oral history research, these things could be very, very important for future research. So again, the impact of MOOCs on the historical discipline, not only our platform for historical learning, but also as this generative repository. So it really boils down, what is the impact of MOOCs for the humanities? So not only for computer science and for things like that, online learning, but for the humanities as well. And then finally, this is another piece of work that um, we're working on at the moment, which is exploring um, how um, new learners behave in MOOCs. So my PhD research looked at uh, newcomers in online communities. And so what we were doing is looking at thematic elements of online community newcomer behavior 
and whether they were very similar to the new learners in MOOCs. So these are some of the themes that arose and some of the new themes that did arise, which are things like rationalization. So why, why are the learners doing this course? And expectations, what are their expectations for uh, completing the course? So on to you, Tim. Thank you. In terms of the impact, I mean, ultimately, I, I have to stand in front of college and explain what bang they got for their buck um, in generating this course. What we can definitely point to is the reputational and marketing impact. I had a very fun 30 minutes being interviewed one Sunday morning for Ottawa Radio's Gaelic Hour, which is the highlight of my media career to date. But there were significant column inches. Um, we're getting recognized in Europe just by the dint of putting on a successful high quality course and engaging with this. And, oops, apologies, wrong button. We do have alignment with international and regional strategy in promoting Trinity's global education brand. Um, student participation engagement and actually embedding it within the college. I suppose really the student recruitment is the great unknown. This course wasn't really designed as a student recruitment course. Sometimes I think MOOCs can either be designed, hopefully for both, but for public good, for student recruitment, for global reach and I suppose marketing. And this one really was a bit about the public good and putting ourselves out there and also taking a step in and learning ourselves. That's, that's going to be my final point as well. Um, innovation in, in Irish higher education. A lot of work with myself and Sylvia on understanding more about community development and um, general altruism, generally doing the public good and getting our academics out there. Now our academics themselves have been interviewed. Their profile is certainly raised. But more importantly now, there's a great example in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and Social Sciences in college about how MOOCs and technology-enhanced learning can really revolutionize and embody different visions of learning in a way that didn't exist at this time last year, which is very useful. Um, these are carefully selected <laughs> quotes, <laughs> but um, we did, this is, this, uh, it's qualitative I know, but it's not cherry-picked, so just trust me on that. But it's certainly very good when we're able to go and show our, our various people in college this is the impact, including I think I might sign up for a degree if they'll have me. I suppose in hindsight, um, I'm not going to talk about my own views on where I think MOOCs are going to be in the future of higher education. <clears throat> I've been doing e-learning long enough to be sceptical of anything that's going to disrupt higher education because every three or four years something comes along with that particular promise. What I will say, though, is that it's been very positive for us actually to go out and do this. It's quite high risk. We've learned by doing, and we will continue to do this and continue to explore in this spaces, regardless of a revenue model, because we see so many of the less tangible benefits around it that it's now embedded as a core part of Trinity's online strategy going forward. And if there's any questions, we'll be more than willing to take them if there's any time permitting. <coughs> um, I think what we might do is, Tim, I know you've got to go at some stage, but if you yeah. can stay, um, then there'll be time to perhaps come up the front door um, over after morning tea. I'll just make a couple of quick comments just so we can catch up the 10 or 15 minutes we're just running behind. So um, you're both here for the next half hour at Absolutely. least, so anyone who would like to have some questions. The thing um, I just wanted to acknowledge in inviting Tim and Sylvia to come to Trinity is that after thinking about Mike being the first speaker, the ideal speaker, we have to acknowledge that Trinity, in using the future learning platform and the manner in which Mike has outlined pedagogically in the way it's driven, and Tim, your last slide around impact and the kind of drivers, I will just have a little um, comeback on the Arizona State one. Um, I think the reason I really want us to engage in this debate, we should not shy away from this debate. Arizona State actually sat on the sidelines until last week and uh, it'll be very interesting to see which driver is really driving their intent. Um, I have a feeling it's a little bit more around pipeline, and of course you indicated that that's not a driver. Not for this MOOC, but for future ones, we'll see. So after morning tea, the program is actually set up to in, uh, investigate really and unpack many of those drivers. Um, so I invite you to talk to Tim and Sylvia. Um, over morning tea or um, over the rest of the program whilst they're here. But thank you again very much for sharing a very insightful, I think, journey that Trinity's taken and the lessons you've learned today. Thanks very much.